Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the People on the Go Lunch and Learn webinar. My name is Melissa Sweat, Online Community Manager at People on the Go, and I'll be moderating our webinar today. But before we start, let's just do a quick check to make sure that you can hear me just fine and see the screen. Please go ahead and locate the questions panel in the GoToWebinar control panel and just type in a quick note letting me know that everything is all good. By the way, that's the same questions panel we'll be using to take your questions at the end of the presentation. So go ahead and just give it a try now. Awesome. Thank you so much for those confirmations there. By the way, if you are needing any assistance, the number to call is right there on the screen, 1-800-263-6317, and I'll also be on the line as well to help you in that questions panel. We'll be sending you a recording of today's presentation, so do be on the lookout for that. We'll actually be posting it in our Accomplishing More with Less groups on Facebook and LinkedIn, and you can find it there. So if you happen to miss anything, the recording will be made available to you. Today's webinar is the Gen Z effect and the future of business. And I have with me Tom Kalopoulos, our guest speaker, who I'll be introducing in just a moment. A quick background about us before we begin, especially for those who are with us for the first time. We have these sessions because our focus at People on the Go is productivity in the workplace. And the topics that you see on the screen are some of the topics that we cover. We offer these uh, workshops in a variety of formats, including the webinar format, just like today's session. Many of our webinars are offered on a monthly basis, and all are offered on by request a basis as well, the ones that are not offered uh, monthly, and you can check them out on our website. If you're not already a member, please check out some of our membership options and see if this might be something you're interested in. We also have many resources available, like our Less is More blog, our Accomplishing More with Less groups, as I mentioned, on Facebook and LinkedIn. And you can also follow our founder, Pierre Kwand, on Twitter. And so now let's dive into today's topic. I'm going to introduce our speaker, Tom Kalopoulos. Tom Kalopoulos is, is acknowledged as one of the industry's leading futurists. He is the author of 10 books and founder of Delphi Group. The 20-year-old Boston-based think tank was named one of the fastest growing companies in the U.S. by Inc. Magazine. Delphi provides advice on innovation practices and methods to global 2000 organizations and government agencies. Tom is also a columnist for Inc.com, an adjunct professor at Boston University Graduate School of Management, an executive in residence at Bentley University, the past director of the Babson College Center for Business Innovation, and also past executive director of Perot Systems Innovation Lab, which was acquired in 2009 by Dell Computer. Mr. Kalopoulos' 10 books include his most recent, The Gen Z Effect, Cloud Surfing, The Innovation Zone, and Corporate Instinct. According to the late Peter Drucker, Tom's writing, quote, makes you question not only the way you run your business, but the way you run yourself. By the way, we will be giving away a copy of the Gen Z Effect at the end of the presentation, so do stay tuned for that. And uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Tom. This transition will take just a moment. Thank you, Melissa, and uh, thank you to everyone who's joining us online today. Uh, this is one of those topics that we all have an opinion on, and I'm very much looking forward to the questions and the commentary as we go through the presentation. So let me begin with the question that I think is probably the most frequent one that I have asked when I talk about Gen Z, which is what is Gen Z? How do we define it? So very simply put, Gen um, Z is uh, what... Excuse me, one moment. Uh, would you mind, uh, did that transition work for you? We, we can't uh, see your slides. You Just can't. Like... Okay. What, do you see anything on the screen now, Melissa? Um... This says stopped. Okay, let me see if we can try that again. Hold on. So when I click the show button, I'm just getting a uh, an error message. Hold on. Okay. Let's try it again. All right, let's try it one more time. How are we doing now? Great. Yeah, now we can see your screen. Wonderful. There we go. Perfect. Okay. So apologies for that. Let's go back into presenter mode. 
and let's answer the question, which is who is Gen Z? Uh, first of all, Gen Z is not, strictly speaking, a generation. And this is one of the things that I want to drive home over the course of the session today and that we talk about extensively in the book. For far too long, technology has separated us. It has caused divisions socially and economically and generationally. We've defined generations based on the technologies that that generation is accustomed to using. Gen Z is what happens when technology becomes a platform. Through its simplification and its affordability, it begins to unite us. And what we see today, if you look at the way grandparents are talking to their grandkids on Skype, if you look at the way that we're adopting mobile technology across all age groups, that really is the Gen Z effect. It is the ability of technology to create a unifying force in all aspects of society. And there are six ways in the book that we talk about these forces. And I'll go over these briefly today as we talk about them all. But it's important to understand that each of these forces represents a tremendous shift, not just organizationally, but socially and globally. And Gen Z is very much written with a global focus. This is not just a phenomenon happening in the US, not just a phenomenon happening in the developed countries of the world. This is truly a global phenomenon. And in that respect, it's very much worth paying attention to at a point in time where the internet is becoming a resource available to so much more of humanity. Today we have about 2.5 billion people that we could generously say are actually involved in using the internet in any sort of an ongoing capacity, but that still leaves out of 7 billion people uh, a large number of, of, of individuals, 4.5 billion let's say, that don't have access to the internet. So we're dealing with a small slice of humanity when we talk about social media, when we talk about things like email, when we talk about our ability to connect via the internet. That's going to change radically. And the Gen Z effect speaks to this tremendous shift that we're going to see globally in how we behave, in how we apply technology to our lives, how we live, how we work, and how we play. So let's talk about, about each of these uh, pretty significant and, and radical shifts. The first of them is what we call breaking generations. And I say here in the subtitle, we're going to undo 5,000 years in 50. And there really is a 5,000 year trend that's going to dramatically reshape over the course of the next 50 years. So I want you to pay attention to this animation on the screen that I'm about to show you. What you're going to see is the changing demographics of global population. So typically when we talk about population, we talk about population pyramids. A population pyramid is nothing more than a visual representation of different age groups within global population. So here you see from uh, birth up through the age of 80, the five-year age bands and the the width of the age band reflects how many people, relatively speaking, are in each of those age bands, males on one side and females on the other. So let's roll the clock forward from 1950 and see what begins to happen to this pyramid shape. That first dotted line represents the educational era of our lives. In between the two dotted lines in the middle is the productive work era of our lives. And then above that last dotted line is what we typically would call retirement. Now, you notice that by 2020, we've gone to a dome shape, no longer a pyramid. As we head towards 2100, something fascinating happens. The age groups, in fact, every single five-band age group, five-year banded age group from birth up through age 65 is nearly identical in terms of the population distribution. It's really within just a few percentage points of every other band. What does that do to society? We call this breaking generations because it finally puts to bed this mythology around generations and generation gaps and generational friction. Uh, Margaret Mead, who popularized the term generation gap in the 1960s, herself came to despise that term. She felt that it implied a, a divisiveness, a necessary friction that had to exist between generations. Well, if you look at this population pyramid, what we're seeing is that we'll have more and more generations in the traditional sense of the word working shoulder to shoulder. So we're living longer, but we're also working longer. I don't plan to retire anytime soon. I love what I do. It's a great passion of mine. It engages me intellectually. And while I might want to spend a bit more time on my boat or on the beach, I don't want to unplug. And that necessity, I think, applies to most folks that I talk to today in the workforce. So what that means is you have more generations working shoulder to shoulder, perhaps three, four, five, we speculate up to seven generations within our lifetime working in a single organization. So if there's a generation gap that creates friction between 
two generations, what does that friction look like between seven generations? Uh, it is impossible to manage is the answer. So something has to give. And what has to give in, in our mind as we wrote the book is this mythology around the necessity of a generation gap. When we begin to let go of that notion of the generation gap, some neat things start to happen. Namely, we build a tolerance, a respect, and an ability to collaborate across generations. So as we move from 1950 to 2100, a couple of things that will help you to better understand this transition. In 1950, of the 2.5 billion people globally that inhabited the Earth, by the way, we hit 1 billion people in the year 1800. 1950, we've got 2.5 billion people. For every person of age 65, we had approximately 10 people that were in the band from 0 to 5 years old. As you move forward, however, today it's about a 1 to 3 ratio. By 2100, it will be a 1 to 1 ratio. So this equalization of the pyramid as it moves through the dome that we currently inhabit to the skyscraper is going to create a tremendous social, political, and economic shift. And that's one of the foundational elements of Gen Z. We have to recognize this and learn how we change our behaviors, how we run our organizations, how we run our political systems. And part of what we have to embrace is that this notion of work-life balance is really an artifact of the past. We're not looking at work-life balance anymore. We're looking at work-life integration. Uh, our work will become something that we'll be able to do well after we would have traditionally retired. In fact, just to point out some of the absurdity of these trends, uh, because we haven't yet experienced a lot of these new behaviors. We're just talking about them right now. But clearly we know that our life expectancy is increasing. Since the uh, 1800s, uh, we've seen an enormous uh, increase in average life expectancy. Within the developed world, now we're seeing it across the entire globe. As we increase access to, uh, to clean water, uh, to sanitation, uh, to uh, better health care, we're seeing globally an increase, not just in population, which will probably tap out at about 10 billion people, but we're seeing an increase in life expectancy. At the same time, we're seeing an increase in work-life expectancy, the amount of time that we dedicate to our work in some capacity over the duration of our lives. And oddly enough, if you plot these two lines, that intersection is the year 2100. In 2100, we will, if you look at the trend lines, and of course the data here is one thing, the reality is another, we will be working after we're dead. So there's a, there's a, there's a merging of these two, the, 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 the separation that is so artificial that uh, causes us to want to... Uh, uh, to detach ourselves from our work is very much based on the physical reality of how work used to be done. Now, this doesn't apply to all sorts of work. There's clearly some physical work, labor, that can only be done until a certain point in most people's lives. But by and large, intellectual work, uh, the kind of work that knowledge workers do, follows this pattern very, very specifically. So let's talk about this notion of being hyper-connected. We've heard a lot about the Internet of Things. I call it the Internet of Everything, and that includes you and me. The numbers here are staggering, and I want to give you just a glimpse at some of the research that we did for the Gen Z effect and prior to that that I had done for cloud surfing to try to put some values on the number of connections. So if we look at population of the world, we see a curve somewhat like this, and we're currently uh, cresting 7 billion on our way to 8 billion. As I said earlier, most pundits seem to think that we're going to tap out at 10 billion people globally. But there is a bit of a flattening of that, of that curve. On top of that, we now have connections between people and machines, our computers, our mobile devices. There are about 10 billion total uh, devices uh, today as we speak, computing devices, many more sensors, many more computers that are embedded in objects from our cars to uh, surveillance cameras. In fact, in the research we did for the Gen Z effect, the number we came up with is that there are 243, 243 independent uh, sensors and devices that you interact with on a daily basis from those in your home to those in your automobile, in your workplace, and in public places. But this still doesn't begin to give us a sense for the enormity of the connections because the next layer is machine-to-machine -machine connections. Conservatively, by 2020, we will have about 150 billion total connections. This is an extraordinarily conservative number. Every time I play this number in front of a group, someone comes up to me afterwards and says, you know what, the, uh, the numbers I saw were significantly greater. 
the reality is this is a moving target. Uh, this is not something which is static. It is not something that we can adequately predict right now because, frankly, we don't know how our behavior is going to change. I can tell you that today, Retail Next, a big company that collects data for retailers, in a single visit uh, of a customer to one of their stores, they will connect, collect, collect over 10,000 separate data points. Over the course of a year, they will actually pull about 800 uh, million people. They have trillions of data points. That's the kind of world that we live in. It's not just the connections, but the data in the analysis of that data that truly provides the promise and the opportunity of moving forward into an era where behavioral science plays such a critical role. Behavior is an enormous part of the way Gen Z will look at the world and the way that they will think about how they interact with each other and with other systems and organizations and institutions. But this number is still very conservative. Let me show you some of the recent research that we did as we were writing the book. If you look at this chart, what you see are the various eras of computing, each plotted out. So that bottom line, that bottom solid line is the mainframe era, moving all the way up to the era of mobility, tablets, and smartphones. The dotted line at the very top shows the increase in computing devices since 1960. Now, I want you to note this is a logarithmic scale. It's not linear. So what this tells us is that every decade from 1960 to the present day, we have increased by one order of magnitude the number of computing devices. Each decade, an increase of one order of magnitude. What does that mean? Well, it means that we are going to be looking at an explosion of computing devices that, that boggles the mind. In fact, the number of projected devices uh, that we see is 1 to the 21st by 2100. And to give you some perspective, that's 100 times as many grains of sand as there are on all the beaches of the world. That's pretty hard to, to fathom, isn't it? I was talking to a friend just yesterday who has a robotics company, and he said to me, you know, Tom, the whole notion of robotics as these humanoid uh, 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 machines is very wrong. Robotics will be miniaturized. They will be created at the cellular level. They will be in the medicines that you, you, you take. They will be in your bloodstream. They will be in, in, uh, in atomizers that, that you breathe. Uh, that is the kind of world that we're describing with these sorts of numbers. Hyperconnected, in this case, leads to some incredibly uh, perverse behaviors. And we see this today, don't we, in the way the kids game, the way that they play, constantly online. But what we fail to understand, for Gen Z, this is not just a behavior that the individual exhibits. This is a social behavior. The reason my 15-year-old son wants to be online is to be online with his friends. The way they play today is the way Gen Z will work tomorrow. But Gen Z is not just a birthright. Gen Z is something that we can choose to embrace and to adopt as a set of behaviors. And that really is the point that I want you to take away from this. Look, I know because I live this as do you, when we watch how these kids interact with the world, we scratch our heads sometimes. Take a look at this quick little video. Think to yourself, what is she doing right now? Exhibiting a behavior that a lot of kids exhibit if you pay close attention, and it's caught in this last frame where she's pushing her finger into her thigh. So to this little girl, a magazine is a defective iPad. And she's proving it to herself by saying, you know, my finger is definitely working. It must be the magazine that's broken. This expectation that there's intelligence in the objects that surround us is part of the hyperconnectivity phenomenon. Look, not all of us are going to get there. Some of us don't want to get there. Some of us will be left behind. I understand that. I appreciate that. And I certainly am not going to be judgmental of it. My point, however, is if you want to remain an active participant in society, in an organizational setting, if you want to engage intellectually, then these are behaviors that you will have to embrace and understand and adopt. And they will change. They will be disruptive. We will negotiate socially what it means to be constantly connected, as we did with telephones and with radio and with every other technology that connected us in the past. And this leads me to this force called slingshotting, one of my favorite to talk about. Slingshotting represents this move away from just technology to the utter simplification, accessibility, and datafication of technology so that it's completely available to anyone at any time without a cost associated. Now, that's a bit of a stretch because right now you still have to invest something in order to be able to access the Internet. But if you look at the trajectory of where we're going and where we want to take civilization, it is clear that the trajectory is towards zero-cost access to the Internet.
That doesn't mean you'll have the best, most effective, highest speed access. It simply means that you will have some access. We're getting to the point where effectively internet access is becoming a human right, a fundamental human right. More important in many cases than food or water because without the internet you can't get to those things. With the internet you then have a voice. You have a voice that will allow you to get other things that you might not have access to. And that's an important distinction here to make when we think about the value proposition of the internet in the future versus where it has been up until now in the developed world, from a global perspective anyway. So what is slingshotting? Well, as I grew up with technology, I had to learn all kinds of different generations of technology, and that took time. I had to invest energy. I had to be my own support person. I had to use user's manuals, for goodness sake. Today, if you buy technology and it comes with a book to learn how to use it, something is wrong with that technology, right? That's not the era that most of us grew up in. So most of us got from the present to the future through a very circuitous route that involved all kinds of different devices and generations of technology, and some of them were very, very complex, as I said. Suddenly, however, people are going from the present to the future almost instantaneously. When you think about that grandmother using Skype with her grandson, she didn't have to use mainframes, mini computers, departmental computers, didn't have to use laptops or a desktop computer, maybe didn't have to use a tablet. She went directly to a smartphone. That's slingshotting. It is bypassing all the technology, the intermediary technology steps that for so long stood in the path of technology ubiquity. This is fundamental to Gen Z because if you don't have the slingshotting effect, you cannot have a single universal set of generational behaviors. Now, be careful with this because I'm not suggesting that generations go away entirely. What I am suggesting and what we talk about in the book is how generations will not become the predominant theme in how we classify people. They won't create the friction that they've created in the past. There will always be cohorts. There will always be shared experiences. You'll always have a bond with your classmates from high school or from college. But now, that will not be the predominant uh, 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 aspect of your, of, your, of your personality that defines who you are. And for too many of us, generations have defined us much more than any as other aspect of who we are. If we think about this going forward, there's an economic component to it that I want to discuss with you. And, and ultimately, when you change the economics of how anything operates, you change the fundamental rules by which that particular uh, process is executed or that game is played. And here's one of the biggest game changers. It is moving away from this notion of affluence as the sole currency. Influence is becoming a new form of currency and a new currency through which to conduct commerce. Now we've all heard about the tremendous wealth disparity that exists in the world today. Some of the recent numbers that you've probably seen correspond with this slide, which talks about how 85 of the richest people in the world own as much wealth as the 3.5 billion poorest, who own about 1% of the world's wealth. Well, to put that in perspective, if you took the Great Pyramid of Giza and use that as re representation of, of, of humanity, uh, of the entire population of the world today, Half of that pyramid's volume would be those 3.5 billion poorest people. That little pail of sand that you see on the screen, that child's bucket of sand, would represent the 85 richest people in the world. So the question is, how do you deal with that kind of disparity? Doesn't that create a social injustice of some sort that has to be rectified? Well, Gen Z provides an answer to this, and I think we're, we're beginning to see this. We saw it in the Arab Spring. We saw it in the Occupy movement. It is the ability to use connectivity, hyper-connectivity, to create communities and to exert influence. And influence now becomes a form of currency. And as we move forward, I think we'll see more and more of this. Now, I have to say that this cuts both ways. Influence is not only going to be in the hands of those people who want to do good and who want to build productive enterprise, it'll also be in the hands of those people that want to do evil. And we've seen this, and we've seen it very recently. Influence has become a currency that is going to increasingly be more and more valuable. Gen Z knows how to trade in that currency. And part of what I'd encourage you to do is to think about, through this lens of influence, think about how organizations, uh, commercial organizations, political, social organizations, are changing as a result of this shift from affluence to influence. One of the other forces that we had a great deal of fun working with because everyone 
is in some way affected by this is this notion of the world becoming a classroom whether it be through uh, virtual learning, uh, the advent of MOOCs, massively open online classrooms such as the Khan Academy or the tremendous increase in the number of universities and post-secondary uh, channels for education available today, clearly something is happening. And what's happening is what happened during the course of the last century for primary school aged children. We've pretty much cracked that nut. We're at the point right now where globally well over 80% of all children who can be enrolled in primary school are enrolled in primary school of some sort. The same will happen with secondary and then post-secondary schools, universities. In fact, some of the projections that we see indicate that over the course of the next decade, we will actually run more graduates through all these various channels of higher education than we have in the recorded history of mankind. Education is one of the greatest catalysts to move any society, any economy forward. And this can define not only nations, but define prosperity on a global scale in ways that nothing else can. After World War II, Japan had a uh, graduation rate from university of less than 1% of its total population. Today, as an economic powerhouse, uh, that has changed radically uh, to close to 50%. So you can see the impact that that has. Peter Drucker once said to me, the greatest catalyst of economic change over the course of the 20th century was the GI Bill and the fact that it created this enormous uh, uh, pool of very talented knowledge workers that ultimately reshaped not just the face of the United States but the face of the world through incredible innovation. The last force, and, and one of the, the ones that, that you can really have a lot of fun with, is what we call life hacking. And the reason you have a lot of fun with this is because this is brand new territory. We're really creating uh, mechanisms by which you can develop businesses, uh, experiment with new ideas that simply didn't exist before. And it's democratizing the process of innovation. One of the ways that's happening is through 3D printing. Uh, 3D printing is one of those technologies that has the opportunity to revolutionize many industries, not just manufacturing, but medicine as well. And it allows anyone to be an innovator. In the book, we profile some of the people that have done incredible things, uh, literally in their second bedroom, in their garage, with 3D printers, from digital stethoscopes uh, to uh, uh, interchangeable components for, uh, for automobiles. Uh, this is a clean slate. Uh, this is really only limited by the extent of your imagination. At some point, and this is already being done in laboratories, we'll be able to print human organs on 3D printers. A revolutionary technology, not just because it allows us to create something in a prototype mode, but because it reduces the cost of experimentation. And this is key for Gen Z. For Gen Z, failure is is something that is not only expected of you, but something which they want to see in order to be able to vet you as an individual. In other words, if you haven't failed, something's wrong with you. Because the cost of failure is so low today. It used to be that to fail, you had to make a big investment. You had to start a business. You had to create a factory. You had to do something that involved capital and resource and time. Today, you can build a business overnight. You can build a product overnight with your 3D printer. There's no excuse not to try and not to fail. In my graduate courses, my undergraduate courses, the expectation that I get from my students is that they want to have two or three businesses that they've already started and failed at before they graduate, just to show that they've taken the risk, that they understand the importance of experimentation, and that they've embraced the notion of failing fast. The second thing uh, that is so dramatically different with Gen Z when it comes to this notion of life hacking is that they don't want to obey the rules if the rules prevent them, bureaucratically prevent them, from getting to some worthwhile objective. So you see a tremendous change in attitude around intellectual property. Now look, I know you and I would say, but hold on, patents are important. They protect the value that someone creates, and if you don't protect that value, then the person won't want to create it to begin with. They'll feel someone else is going to steal it from them. The problem is using patent law across the board to apply to all sorts of industries, technologies, and ideas. Clearly, we're at a point where we have to rethink this whole notion of intellectual property. There are areas where intellectual property could help to facilitate the cure for diseases that plague us, could help to 
create devices uh, that would enhance quality of life, and yet the, uh, the, the reality is that intellectual property today is standing in the way of many of those discoveries. So we see a tremendous shift in the research we did. 74% of the people that we polled told us that the patent system needs an enormous, uh, significant overhaul, and 20% said that it would eventually serve no purpose. Again, easy to, easy to dismiss that, but I caution you. Take a step back. Think about the fact that the kids who are saying this today are going to be your legislators, your leaders. They will be running the businesses of tomorrow. And lastly, this notion of crowdfunding, which is making capital available to everyone. And this is a tremendous change in the way we look at how we fund great ideas. Uh, I think that crowdfunding today is one of the greatest untapped uh, opportunities for new businesses and new innovations to, uh, to take shape. And we're just beginning to see this. Over a billion dollars at this point, I think it's closer to $2 billion, has flowed through, uh, through Kickstarter, other crowdfunding vehicles like Rock the Post uh, allow you to, uh, to take an equity stake in a company as well. These allow individuals to invest on a very small basis as, as an individual, but collectively to provide a tremendous amount of lift for a new idea. And the market votes on it. The market decides ultimately which ideas are good ones and which are not. Is it 100% efficient? Of course it isn't. Uh, not every idea that's worthy is going to make it through a crowdfunding process either. But many more that were worthy and wouldn't ma have made it through a traditional angel or VC or more traditional uh, lending process will find uh, success and take root through crowdfunding. So these forces, these six forces, are shaping society. They're shaping business. They're shaping political institutions. They are changing the way that we live, we work, and we play. And ultimately, embracing these forces, understanding them and making them part of your life is a choice that you make, not just based on when you were born, but based on how you want to live your life, based on the objectives that you have and the ambitions that you want to execute on. That's Gen Z. It is a fascinating conversation. I look forward to hearing some of the questions that you have and, and sharing some more ideas with you. But I would encourage you to start looking at the world with a, a, a non-generational lens. Try that on for size and see what that feels like. The tolerance and the uh, ability to create uh, teams that collaborate at a level that I think we simply have not been able to experience is going to be something that will benefit all of us. Melissa, I'm going to turn back over to you, and uh, hopefully we have some questions teed up. Thank you, Tom, so much. Incredibly fascinating presentation. And everyone, please go ahead and start to submit your questions in that questions panel. We'll be getting to the Q&A in just a moment. Here is Tom's contact information if you'd like to get in touch with him and learn more. And before we get to the Q&A, I have a few reminders. For those who might have joined us later in the session, I'd just like to point you to some additional resources that are available to you from People on the Go. Please visit our Less is More blog and join our Accomplishing More with Less groups on Facebook and LinkedIn. That's also where we're going to be posting the recording of today's session. You can find it there. We'll be posting it uh, later today or by tomorrow at the latest. And please follow our founder, Pierre Kwand, on Twitter. Some upcoming workshops and events I'd like to tell you about. This is our flagship program, Accomplishing More with Less. This will help you really transform your workplace habits uh, to become more productive, achieve more accomplishments and results with a lot more happiness and a lot less stress. We have our in-person workshop coming up February 27th in San Francisco. We have another session specifically for managers also in San Francisco in April. And then we have our new leadership program, which is a 12 week intensive online program done through webinars and online meetings and through assignments virtually. And you can learn more about that by by visiting our website here. Going up to workshops. Under the people section, you can find more info about the Accomplishing More with Less programs. We're also offering scholarship opportunities for these upcoming sessions. So please go ahead and visit this link, which I'm going to send you in the chat panel now that's coming to everyone shortly. It's a survey monkey link there that's coming to you and you can find more information about the scholarship opportunities and apply there.
Wonderful. And now for our Q&A. Great question here right off the bat. What does this mean for municipalities? Their staffing selection, workforce commitment, voting for service, provision of services, and public outreach. That's a great question, Melissa. In fact, one of the case studies that we talk about in the book uh, looks at uh, how uh, Hawaii, which uh, Honolulu actually specifically, was building a new website for the city, and they put it out to bid, and the bids they were getting back were in the millions of dollars. One bid was $9 million. And uh, some folks who were technically savvy in the community caught wind of this. And uh, they decided that $9 million was a big price tag for a website. Uh, that in today's world of open source and WordPress, it just shouldn't cost that much. So they mounted a bit of a, of a campaign uh, as a community of, of technically astute individuals to push back on the city, and the city decided to uh, uh, actually open up the, the bidding process to a hackathon. And they got folks to come in and for uh, a few hundred dollars uh, to create mock-ups and uh, examples, prototypes of what the city website would, would look like. We see a lot of this community hacking going on where folks are getting together uh, in small groups sometimes to um, uh, really for no other reason other than to be more effective, efficient, and less wasteful in the application of, of local resources and local tax dollars um, to help out. And if this doesn't resonate with folks, they just need to look as far as Wikipedia. The reality is that it's much easier for us to volunteer, to invest that way in a cause uh, than it ever has been. So in the off hours, the wee hours of the morning, the late hours at night, uh, you can become part of a value-added community, a value-added network, and have enormous impact. So for municipalities, I would say, begin to think about how you can do that, how you can reach out. There's an organization called Code for America that actually organizes these hackathons. How are you reaching out to your community to allow them, give them the opportunity to be involved, to have a voice? I said earlier during the course of the, uh, of the session, Gen Z has a megaphone, an individual megaphone, community, collective megaphone. How are you leveraging that megaphone? Are you giving them a voice? Are you allowing them to share their thoughts and opinions and actually take action somehow to provide value back to the community? And it's surprising how many people want to do that and will take time uh, out of their day uh, to do that because they feel it's the right thing to do. Gen Z is motivated by purpose. They want transparency and in return they'll provide value. And it's a very interesting uh, social contract, one that we haven't seen uh, to this extent certainly uh, over the course of my lifetime. And, and I think it's a very encouraging uh, uh, model that, that municipalities, local governments can, can look at to help support a lot of things that otherwise uh, would require uh, more cost and, uh, and more complexity. Wonderful. Thank you, Tom. You've touched on this quite a bit, but how can companies and organizations start to adapt now in the present time to start to create a more inclusive and post-generational work culture? So there's one specific thing that every organization should be doing, and amazingly 95% of all organizations that we talk to in surveying and, and in the research for the book are not doing this, and it's called reverse mentoring. Uh, this is not a concept we came up with. Jack Welch actually began doing this in the 1990s with the advent of the Internet. So let me describe what it is. A lot of big companies, Cisco is, is doing this, the Hartford uh, is doing this. Reverse mentoring is taking new hires, young kids who are Gen Z by birth or millennials by birth, and actually making mentors out of them, not mentoring them, but making mentors out of them so that they then mentor uh, older generations, older individuals who perhaps don't understand the value of social networking, the etiquette of Twitter, what a hashtag is uh, for that matter. When Jack Welch began doing this, he wanted to make sure that GE didn't miss out on the Internet. And he felt the only way to really get these, uh, uh, these uh, older executives to understand what the Internet was was to pair them up with younger kids. And he mandated it. He said every executive has to have a reverse mentor. At Cisco, it's optional. At the Hartford, it's optional. That's fine. You know, it doesn't have to be mandatory. But are you doing it at all? And if you are, are you doing it in a systemic way, not just a one-off, but doing it over time? The value here is extraordinary because the, the mentor gets a lot of value because they're paired up with a senior executive. There's an obvious value that's going downstream, but the senior exec now gets this tremendous value and insight from the younger individual who's on the front lines of social media, who understands hyperconnectivity in a way that perhaps he or she never would. So reverse mentoring is one of the most tactical, 
uh, immediate and uh, uh, and least risky ways to uh, to begin taking advantage of Gen Z and, and beginning to create a post-generational organization. Very good. Thank you, Tom. Another question here. When you say that Gen Z wants transparency, do you mean that they don't want to be trained in how to use a device or app or that they want easy access to information on things such as how government decisions are made? Yeah, thank you for that. It really is the latter. The, what They expect transparency in terms of being able to, to – um, uh, to see the process, to understand the purpose of the process, why is it done this way? And there are two reasons why. There are two reasons. One is obvious, one is not as, as obvious. The obvious reason is, if I'm part of this process, if I'm affected by it, impacted by it, then I'd like to know what's going on um, because I'm part of it. That one makes mm -hmm. sense. The other one is less obvious, but in some cases even more important, and that is I want to make sure that if something is being done which I can impact and change, I have the opportunity to do so. Uh, and that's critical to understand about Gen Z. Gen Z wants to be involved. They want to take an active role in shaping the process, the project, the system, whatever it is they're involved in. And transparency gives them the ability to look at uh, the underpinnings, the guts, the behind the curtain uh, aspect of that system that might not otherwise be obvious uh, to a casual observer and to have input. Now, this is disruptive for a lot of us. You know, We don't want to air our dirty laundry. We don't want our customers to see what our process looks like. But imagine the impact, if done correctly, that that might have to fine-tune uh, a process to the needs of your customer, a business partner, or an employee. That's what Gen Z means by transparency. Uh, and by the way, Gen Z feels if you're not going to be transparent, we'll find out what we need to find out anyway. I mean, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll hack the system. We'll figure it out one way or another. Um, so why not cooperate? Why not do it uh, in, in a manner that makes it easier for for uh, for both sides of, the, of that equation? That's the that's the uh, the purpose of, of of transparency as far as Gen Z is concerned. Allow me to be involved, to have a voice, and to shape this for the better. Great. And Tom, I think we have time for one more question here. Can you please give an example of, and you gave many, but can you give one example of an organization or program that's really doing this right? There, so we came across a lot of organizations that are doing this. One of the ones that we were amazed at, there were two Hyatt and Lowe's both, and it really is a toss-up, but I'll pick Hyatt right now because it was a, uh, it created a very human uh, put a very human face on on Gen Z. A lot of times when we talk about Gen Z, we talk about technology. Hyatt has uh, a program that we talk about a great deal in, in the book, the, the Hyatt Way. And, and the whole notion behind the Hyatt Way is to understand the individual outside of his or her demographics, to not impose generational labels on them. They're a boomer, they're a millennial, they're an Xer, but yet to look at their behaviors and truly understand that person at a very, very deep deep level. And Hyatt has done this, not just with their employees, but with their customers as well. And there's a lesson to be learned in this. In the age of big data, it's far too easy to, uh, to lose the humanity uh, involved in how we connect and how we communicate. And I think we have to reinforce uh, the, uh, the, the, the social aspects of this technology that allow us to uh, to connect on a, on a human basis, not just on, on you know from the data that represents us. Uh, and companies like Hyatt understand that they recognize that, uh, and they look at people based on the individual rather than their demographic profile. And they started doing that with their with their customers as well, uh, with their guests. And Lowe's is doing the same thing. And we were amazed at the degree to which Lowe's said to us, you know, we don't care what age group you belong to. What we care about is what do your, what do your behaviors tell us about what you like, what your interests are? Because if we can meet you at that level, if we can treat you not as a customer that's part of a generation, but a customer who has a very specific set of needs that we understand intimately, then you're more likely to do business with us. That engenders loyalty. Uh, and I think that's a very important lesson for, for Gen Z. If you want their loyalty, you really have to understand them. Companies that are doing that uh, are going to have an enormous competitive advantage. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tom, for your presentation today. Thank you all for joining us and for your questions. I'd like to just uh, remind you, if you are already a member of People on the Go, uh, or a, an individual member or an organization member, you may already have access to these sessions coming up. So do check out your organization's website uh, for information on signing up there.
And then finally, I'd like to announce our winner of the, of the Gen Z Effect. Congratulations to Lauren Marotti. We'll be sending you an email and we'll uh, be obtaining information on where to send the book. So congratulations, Lauren. Thank you again all for joining us. Once more, Tom, thank you again. Always a pleasure to have you back. When you exit the session today, everyone, a feedback form will pop up on your screen and we would greatly appreciate your feedback. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.